Hi, thank you for watching Yoga with Elia. This is Elia, and today we're going to have a nice one hour therapeutic practice where we focus on territory of the body that usually gets constricted and compressed and precipitates low back pain. So, whether you have low back pain or not, it'll still help you either manage it or offset it from ever occurring in the future. So the props that we'll be using, we might not use all of them, but it'll be good to have it handy just in case, in case uh, your flexibility or strength doesn't permit with what we got in store today. So two blocks, one yoga strap, and two blankets. And as I always say, if you don't have yoga blankets, which are just Mexican blankets, then you can use a big bath or beach towel. So what we'll start is we're gonna set up a pranayama position, a breathwork position with your blankets. So where you want to begin is you have a blanket shape that's about one quarter or one third of your mat, which you'll actually want to unfold so it's about one half the size of your mat. And you can see when I lay this down from the side, the way that we fold it is typically called a trifold. And this is one of our gifts from the Iyengar tradition, from the teachings of BKS Iyengar himself. So when you lay the blanket down, it's important that you have the main fold facing you and all the different, the several edges facing away from you. So you're gonna fold one third of the blanket length over the top, and then one third you go from underneath so that when you look at it from the side here, it has like a little zigzag S shape. Okay, one end has tassels, one end does not. You're gonna place the end that does not right at the top of the mat, and that's where your head is gonna go. So your head always goes on the end of the blanket that's opposite of these tassels. And obviously, if you're using towels, then you use any end you want. And then with your second blanket or towel, you're gonna start with this one quarter or one third mat size blanket shape, and you're going to stay there, you're going to keep it there, and you're going to do the same fold. So you're going to go one-third over, one-third under. And just double check that all of the edges of your fold are nice and neat, nice and flush, so that you can be more comfortable when you lay upon it. You're going to place that second blanket right at the top, so as you can see, it forms a letter T. And then you're going to grab your belt. You won't need the blocks right now. And so how we begin is you're going to have your belt. You're going to start with sitting on the blanket first. Don't sit off the blanket. And then unroll your belt. Make sure that your loop is wide enough so that you can actually step your legs through it. And then when you do that, all we want to make sure to do for now is to have the knees not be wider than hips width apart. So if I turn towards you, what you're going to see is as I press my legs out into the belt, you see how my outer knees are pretty much at the same distance and width as my outer hips. So when we lay down in any kind of neutral or extended position at the hips, we want to make sure that the knees and legs never go wider than the hips width. So you start with your feet flat and your knees bent, and you can hold on to your legs and just roll yourself back so you technically come down one vertebra at a time from the bottom through the middle to the top. And once your head actually arrives on the second blanket, if you notice the blanket pushing or even touching your neck, slide yourself down a little bit because for the most part, unless you have a specific neck injury that you're overcoming or some kind of chronic condition, you always just want the blanket that's for the head to only touch the head and not touch the neck. Okay? So, Second part is notice just how you're laying. So if you close your eyes, you can put your hands on your torso and just feel where exactly with reference to your body that first big center blanket is located. And actually try to tune in to whether or not it's actually centered. Or if there's maybe like one ounce, if you can feel that subtly, of weight difference between the left and right. And so right from the get-go, what we have is just this request call to start tuning in and to start actually tuning in to a very precise sensation, which is how you're laying on a blanket, an otherwise rather unfamiliar and new position. 
So once you feel you're centered, you're not tipping one way or the other, go ahead and walk your legs straight. And if you're on the hard floor, you can always just slide your legs straight. And once your legs straighten out, the last thing before you let your body relax is you can push your legs out against the belt. And as you do this, I want you to try to step your heels out a little bit wider. So already you're setting your heels to be at the far reaches of the lateral distribution. And then as soon as you relax your legs, if you look down at your feet, your feet should be, your toes should be pointing straight up, which is exactly what we want here. And then with your arms, place your hands actually right at the sides. So your body is making the same shape as the blankets that you're laying on top of. And this will allow you a lot more access into the chest, what is otherwise a rather constricted part of our respiratory compartment, at least for most of us in our modern and unfortunately very sedentary culture where so much of our lives are spent sitting. And even if we're active, we still sit a lot. We sit to eat, we sit to drive, to travel, we sit to have fun at the movie theater or concerts. And so all of that leads to this habit that the body takes in of constantly closing off the chest. And when we set up in a pose like this, you're just doing the opposite. And when you give this pose your first minute, just make sure that minute has nothing to do with being active. In other words, you are not making the pose happen anymore. After the initial setup, you want to have the pose actually start to emerge through the body, in a manner of speaking. So as you relax and allow your arms to be heavy, notice how your shoulder blades can kind of articulate and mold around the blanket. And then trace that right down the torso. And even though we're not lifted high, in a way, let your whole body pour down and pour over the blanket as if you were pouring water on it. And as we know, water doesn't resist. Water, although has weight, water accepts whatever you put into it and whatever you put it into. Water doesn't have a definitive shape. It takes the shape of its container. And so let your body kind of shape around the blankets. And it's good to realize here that the adult human body is roughly 70% water. And so really it is our chemical nature to be able to do this, to be able to just mold and adapt to a certain shape. And this is just a process of relaxation. Yoga is one of the oldest ways to hack the body, to hack health, to hack an insightful, awe-inspired state of mind. It's a way to hack devotion, love, and passion. It's a way to hack hope, really. And one very useful technique to help us hack relaxing and diffusing the vestiges of muscular tension in the body is to actually relax the face. So just notice the, the character of your eyes. Notice the character of your eyelids. And what is also part of the visual system that really doesn't have the reputation of being a part of the visual system is the forehead. So relax that too. Relax your throat.
relax your jaw and relax your tongue. The ability to have this type of facial relaxation is a way that we start to, you can say trick the nervous system into responding with relaxation so that even if it is the case that you might not feel relaxed, taken on a roll with your facial expression as if you are relaxed. Works on your nervous system because your nervous system is has evolved to read the expression of your face. And it's evolved that way, mostly because we are social creatures. And so we've really evolved to respond to facial expressions, our own and others. And the American psychologist Paul Ekman did phenomenal work in discovering how expressions do elicit this effect. How actually putting on a genuine smile can begin the process of provoking the feelings of joy and happiness, the feelings that are responsible for the appearance of smiles. And so a simple technique of breathing that we'll start with today, because when we're laying on this pranayama blanket, what we're actually doing as well is we're exposing the abdomen and we're exposing the front of the chest, which because they're usually so constricted throughout our life, they don't allow much movement. And a good functional habit of breathing has to entail moving, movement of the abdomen and the ribs. And this is called the Samavriti technique and it's really just the first stage of Samavriti. Sama is the Sanskrit word that means equal or same, and riti can be translated as movement or revolutions or cycles. So it's an equal moving breath technique where our inhale and exhale are going to be of the same duration. And as I've taught before, just to touch on it real quick, whenever you breathe any breathing technique, it always has as its backbone a fundamental sequence of movement, movement in the torso. So the sequence when we inhale has to begin with the expansion of the belly. And as the inhale reaches its last third, last 33% or so, then you have to start expanding the chest. And as you exhale, the first one third of your exhale should come from a contraction of the chest. And the last two thirds of your exhale should come from the contraction of your abdomen. And for today, I don't want you to focus much about expanding the chest because we've all been habituated to really just breathe pretty much with the upper respiratory compartment, with the chest and the ribs. I want you to just really designate your abdomen for better movement because when we let our abdomen expand, we allow more oxygen to be sequestered in the bottom lobes of our lungs, which is what accounts for two thirds of our breath volume in the first place. So I'll count for us for the first three cycles as you do this, and then you can finish the last couple on your own. So again, let your body get soft and relax. Let your face just completely liquefy. Breathe through your nose always, unless there's a problem doing that, if you have a clogged nose or anything. And we're going to go five count inhale, five count exhale. I'm going to count a little slower. So when you start your inhale, don't pull in breath too quickly. When you start your exhale, don't push out too quickly. But remember, through the five count, 
you have to be able to get fullest inhalation and fullest exhalation. And so all breathing techniques start with an exhale. So go ahead, take an inhale and exhale everything you can find. Exhale all the way to the basement of your lungs. And then slowly inhale for five, four, three, two, all the way up, one, exhale, five, four, three, two, all the way out, one, inhale, five, four, three, two, all the way to the top, one, exhale, five, four, three, two, all the way to the bottom, one, last one, inhale, five, four, try to stretch your belly even further, three, Go right up into the chest now, two, all the way to the top brim, one, exhale, five, four, remember, chest first, three, now start with the belly, two, keep contracting, all the way out now, one, and then last two on your own. And what we do here when we practice this technique is we're really equalizing the girth of the inhale and exhale because ultimately what we can't forget is that without breath, we don't have life. We can't live when we can't function. And if we have a restricted volume of breathing, just basically dysfunctional breathing, in the same exact sense, we have a restricted way of living. So anytime there's a dysfunction in the breath, rest assured, there's going to be a dysfunction elsewhere in the body. <clears throat> and so what we look to when we do yoga is we enhance the function of the breath and we magnify its capacity so that we can magnify and enhance the capacity and function of every other system, muscle, joint, and organ. Once you're done with your last exhale, just let a couple of natural breaths roll through. Keep your eyes closed and as you're just aware of your breath, don't actually try to make it deeper. And it's okay if it's very shallow. In fact, when you're really relaxed, you don't need much oxygen. And so if you ever notice that your breath moves so minimally when you're in a relaxed state, that's kind of a sign that your breath is working good, or at least your relaxation technique is working for you. So then still keeping the eyes closed as we kind of gather up our body again to start moving. You can begin a little bit of wiggling in your toes and fingers, ankles and wrists. And once that mobility restores and you're ready, start to walk your knees right back towards the hips where they begin. And then go ahead, lift your knees up and just push the belt right off the legs. And still just staying on the blanket for a moment, hug your legs to your chest. And then just take a couple of breaths there like this. And this kind of a leg hug, which you don't want to actually keep your thighs all the way together. It's important to keep your thighs separated. So you could just either hold your fingertips or you can even hold one knee at a time. But when you hug your legs in, you're pulling your knees just basically towards the armpits. But the way that it's good to wake up like this in the morning, especially if you have low back pain and stiffness, is as you're breathing with each exhale, and go ahead and do it right now, hug your legs in a little bit tighter, a little bit deeper. And then each inhale, try to press your tailbone to the floor. 
Each exhale, hug your legs a little bit deeper to the side ribs. And if you start your morning like this, even before you get out of bed, maybe even before you open your eyes, do this for a minute, maybe even to take some deep breaths so while starting to create a little bit more flexibility and circulation in the hips and legs, you're also starting to oxygenate your body. And that's why it's so important in the paradigm of yoga therapy to feed our body oxygen whenever we remember, because without oxygen, there is no life and function. And as we stay mindful about good breathing and we do it consistently, we replace the bad habits of dysfunctional breathing now with functional breathing. So eventually it's going to be the case that if you do this enough, you won't even have to remember like, oh, I got to breathe. Your body will just know what to do because of the good and consistent habits you've established. So then let's go ahead and bring the feet down to the floor. And then to take this blanket out, all we need is the bottom blanket out from underneath us. So lift your hips up, slide the blanket, the bottom edge of the blanket out from underneath you, and then bring your butt down. And then just roll over to the side and then slide the rest of the blanket out. Put that next to you. And then let's continue on here with a couple of nerve glides. And this is a technique, again, that's very good to not just only start your day with as well, but to actually do it at the end of the day or beginning of the day if you have and if you suffer from just low back pain. Because if you're laying down, your spine is horizontal, which means that the weight of your body and gravity doesn't smush your lower back as it inevitably does whenever anybody's standing upright. So you can do a lot of very good, safe work on the hips, on the legs, even the core, without ever having to stand up on the feet. And that's kind of the basis of yoga therapy. So extend your left leg flat to the floor, and then pick up your right thigh, interlace your fingers just behind the thigh, and adjust your hands, whether closer to the knee or closer to the hip, so that your elbows can be at their straightest. But you're just making a barrier, pretty much, with your arms. So you want to make sure that your thigh stays vertical, the knee stays above the hip, and it doesn't deviate the whole time. Engage your left foot, your left leg, press the left heel into the floor. And so a nerve glide is basically a dynamic version of a stretch. So you're going to start inhaling without doing anything different. And now as you begin your exhale, start to straighten your right knee while still keeping the thigh vertical. Now, if the knee doesn't want to straighten all the way, that's fine. Don't go all the way if it hurts. So inhale, let your knee relax back down to position one. Exhale, re-extend your leg back up. Inhale, knee down, foot down. Exhale, as you extend your leg. Now, if your knee does straighten, that's fine. Just stay right there. And we don't need a lot of flexibility. We just need to create some tone and some circulation in the muscles. So you're going to inhale down, exhale up, continuing on for five more like this. What's good to understand here about how our anatomy works is that when you straighten your leg, there's really only one set of muscles that do this, and those are your quadriceps. So as your leg straightens, your quadriceps have to engage. And by association, your hamstrings have to lengthen. And this is a neurological reflex. It's a stretch reflex called reciprocal inhibition. So that's where the reciprocal muscles of your quadriceps get inhibited, release, whenever your quadriceps contract. And the beautiful thing there is that's built into you. You can't override that. So with an adequate amount of quadricep engagement, your hamstring has no chance of staying tight. The problem is when we're doing other standing poses and other forward bends and hip flexion poses, we just don't have the sense of what an adequately engaged quadricep really feels like. So that might take some time to get used to and build up, but this is a lifelong practice, so all we got is time. Good. Now, when you inhale, bring your foot down. We'll switch from there. Picking up your left leg. Hold behind the thigh. Extend your right leg down. Remember, your thigh stays vertical. Your arms are just a barrier. 
press the right heel into the floor. Start with a big inhale. And exhale, slowly extend your knee up. And if you do run into a situation where your knee can't straighten, say your knee stops at about like the 60 degree point and it just won't be able to go further than that or else it hurts a lot. So what you want to be able to do as you continue with this, it doesn't matter how stiff you are, how stiff you think you are, any movement is a good amount of movement and anybody can be challenged. So if your knee stops at 60 degrees, notice if the next time you start to straighten it, it can maybe go 60 and a half degrees. Hell, maybe 60 and a quarter degrees. It doesn't matter because one thing that I always have found students, some students being unrealistic about is how quickly they should get flexible, right? How quickly do they expect results? And what's actually real is your body develops and adapts to stress because when we're working out or doing yoga, that's a certain kind of good functional stress. It adapts to it incrementally, you know, so the same at the same speed that we build muscle, if we're doing straight strength training or weightlifting or bodybuilding even, that's the same pace that your muscles can lengthen at. And so if you come in very tight and you start your yoga and then a month later or two months later, expect that you should have a dramatic amount of hamstring flexibility increase, that's just not realistic. But what's important to keep in mind is progress, however incremental it is, or however incremental it seems, is still progress, right? Because we don't walk up a flight of 20 stairs by jumping right to the top, one step at a time. That's how everything gets done. Good, and then inhale, bring your foot down, and then let's just go right into a little bit of more hip work. So we're going to start with external rotation. So you're going to pick up your left foot and then place the foot or the ankle rather on top of the right knee. And then you're going to heel and toe as you can see your right foot to the left and then stop when your foot's about underneath your opposite knee, underneath your left knee. Keep your left foot engaged and then just go ahead and allow both legs to lay down. You can place your left hand right here at the thigh, good, and then instead of just pushing your leg down, I want you to just try to push your thigh away from you. So you're working more towards creating traction and separation and length in the hip joint, not just the rotation only. I want to make sure that your left foot's engaged, so feel how the outer blade of your foot sits on the right thigh and try to press the outer edge of your foot into your leg or try to wrap it around the thigh where it almost feels like as if you're trying to turn the sole of your foot towards the floor. That's an ankle movement called eversion. It might take some time to get used to it and develop it, but just think of that direction of movement. Sole the foot towards the ground. And taking just another couple of breaths here. Again, notice how your exhale, specifically how your exhale, really starts to feel in the, the landscape of your hip flexibility right now. So as you take a deep breath in, how does a deep inhale referenced in the hips? And as you take a deep exhale, does that change? In other words, is it easier to hold this position during the inhale or during the exhale? One more breath out. And then carefully take your left foot first off the knee and then heel and toe your right foot back to center before going the other direction where the right ankle goes on the left knee and then heel toe your left foot to the right and again, start to lay both legs down like this. Press your hand right into the root of your thigh and just think of distance. You want to create longer space, more space between the right armpit and the right hip or between the right knee and the right armpit. So you're pushing your leg down and away. 
And now with the right foot, try to rotate the sole of your foot down. What we do here when we practice or we activate this kind of a foot mechanism is we're protecting the knee joints. So it doesn't really have that much to do with what's happening in the hips, but as we know, it's hard to do anything in just one particular joint. Most yoga poses are compound movements. That means more than one joint is doing something, more than one muscle group is doing something. And so because that's the case, it's good to always exercise techniques that take care of all the players participating within any single movement. Let's take two more out breaths. And make sure that your exhale is complete because every time we exhale, we flush out all of the waste product that we take in. And we exhale a lot of carbon. And as chemists, organic chemists would tell you, Carbon is what things attach to, things like toxins especially. So when we exhale carbon, we exhale some of the chemistry to which toxins and waste products attach, essentially. Good. So first, take your right foot off the knee, and then heel and toe your left foot back to center. Now the next part, that was external rotation, now we'll go into internal rotation. So you're gonna just heel and toe your right foot to the right. You can always turn or lift your head and look at it. You wanna make sure that you don't walk your foot any further to the right than where your right thigh stays in line to the right side of the torso. And once your foot gets there, you place the left ankle on the top or on the lateral part of the lower thigh. And then as soon as you relax your legs, and just go ahead and relax your legs, don't do anything active with the left leg other than everting the foot. So that same ankle technique that we had in the external rotation position. So other than that, relax the leg and just allow the weight of the leg to start pulling the right thigh down. And that's where all of the magic is. How we started class today, again, if you have low back pain, I can almost guarantee, I was always taught not to guarantee, but I can almost guarantee that if you start your mornings like this and you have chronic low back pain, that you will alleviate, you will start to derive more quality of life and be more pain free throughout the rest of your day. And so what happens when you internally rotate your leg, you're also internally rotating your hip, you're putting some length into your psoas muscle. Colloquially, it's called just the hip flexor. And so our hip flexors are known to be the culprits that get tight and congested and end up feeding into compression and pain of the lower back. And your body's going to be kind of tilted off sideways. Your right side of the pelvis, your right glute might be off the ground entirely. That is not a problem. Please do not try to rotate your pelvis or plant your right glute back down. Just allow the right leg to rotate at its own pace. And again, combine this with exhaling. When you're exhaling, your diaphragm moves up into the thoracic cavity into your chest. And so what that happens at that point, if your diaphragm moves up, it actually lengthens. So your diaphragm gets a stretch in it when you exhale. And the advantage of that is because your diaphragm shares muscular fibers with your hip flexor muscle, as you lengthen and stretch your diaphragm, by association, you're getting a little extra lengthening of those fibers of the psoas muscle that, shared, that are shared with the diaphragm. Okay, carefully take your left foot off the right knee and then heel and toe your right foot back to center. And now heel and toe your left foot to the left. Carefully lower your knee down and then place the right ankle on the left knee. And when you do this, again, just relax the legs other than your feet, keep the legs nice and soft, let weight and gravity do most of the work. When you do the external and the internal rotation, as we just did, because all of us have slightly different structure, there's always variance between how 
human, the human body, from human to human, individual to individual, is organized. The actual technical shape and angles of the bones, they're not all completely and exactly the same as for other people. And there's a, it's not a, exactly a condition, but it's more there's a structure of hip development and femur, thigh bone development, that's called antiversion and also retroversion. So if you notice that on this pose, your thigh can come to the ground no problem very easily, then what can be likely the case is that you have a little bit of antiversion in your hip, in the way that your, your hip bone, your actual, uh, the ball of the femur, how it's angled with reference to the leg bone itself. Let's take two more breaths. Remember, keep your exhales very strong, very dominant, so you continue to rid yourself of waste product. This comes from the fact that when we live in a high stress state or just a high pace state, which is just another form of stress, we don't tend to focus on the exhales by default. When we're in survival mode, survival mode is all about <laughs> sucking air, getting more oxygen, right? Not fainting, not dying. And so all of this habit of constantly just inhaling, inhaling, inhale, that hasn't really left much room and space to develop the exhale. And so it's actually allowed us to hold on to breath and toxins, chemistry of the breath, that should have been exhaled. So one more good exhale out. Good. And then you're going to take your right foot off the left knee. Heel and toe your left foot back to center. And then roll over to your side. And we'll come on up. And so we'll start actually in a little bit of a toe sit. So what you're going to do is you're going to curl your toes under just like this. You can lift your knees, you can even lift them up a little bit higher just to get your toes spread before you come back down. But when you are down, if it's a little too much tension, right at once, separate your thighs, and initially just try to pull, use your index fingers, pull your little toes away from the fourth toes, then do that to the fourth toes, and do that to the third toes, so you're creating space between your toes as much as possible. For anybody that can't sit this far, if you can't actually get your glutes to your heels, you can use a block or you can use a bolster or a couple of blankets and just put that between your butt and your heels. And you can prop yourself up as high as you like. But if you can bring your knees together and do this, again, you can bring your knees together and still have a little bit of space between your glutes and your heels. Right, because if your knees, for whatever reason, can't flex that much right now, it still doesn't diminish the fact that your feet could be flexible, or at least you could work on the flexibility of the feet. And for some of you, this is going to be pretty intense. So I would say adjust either by tilting forward, taking some weight off the feet, adjust so that on a scale of 1 to 10 of intensity, 10 being excruciating like emergency room pain, and 1 being negligible and almost no sensation at, to be at about a level six or seven, especially for therapeutic reasons, so that you have some challenge and some stimulation going into the system, but it's not so overbearing that it actually makes your body contract. And this is one mistake that's often made in yoga is people want to go so deep into something that they try to stretch their muscles out with such intensity that they go way beyond a six or seven and they start to bear on a nine or ten where it's nearly intolerable and what that does to your nervous system it just makes it freak out it makes it reject everything that you're doing with your body because what it notices is that you're in a state of some kind of threat there's a threat to the system. And what the body does when there's threat is it locks down and gets tight, right? When we're threatened, when we're stressed, our natural response is not to open up and get flexible. So then come forward, point your toes, and then sit on the heels. Good. And while you're sitting on your heels, 
Let's get a nice gentle spinal twist going first. So let's go to the left. Bring your left hand behind you. Place your right hand on the outer left thigh. And if you need to recline back to get your hand to the floor, that's fine. Just make sure you're never slouching, slumping. Right? Everything is always done with an extension, like an amplification of your sternum and chest. So as you inhale, feed your left arm into the ground, which is going to promote more lengthening, more heightening. And as you exhale, start to pull with your right arm. And again, don't muscle this pose too much. So about a five, even a six level of strength input, especially how you're pulling on your right leg, because you don't want to over twist. Getting more range of motion isn't necessarily better. And this is why therapeutic practice is important. Therapeutic practice doesn't mean basics or it doesn't mean that you suck. It doesn't mean that it's not advanced. Therapeutic practice really means to not err so much on the side of covering more distance, getting more and more flexibility, but it really errs on the side of how precise are your actions? How well can you breathe? How well can you maintain the whole artifice of a single posture from the nice setup that you started with to the very last breath? So take one more big inhale, keep the chest nice and tall, shoulders down, exhale, and then inhale back to center and we'll turn to the right. So right hand behind you, left hand holds the outer right thigh. Again, recline back. Just make sure that you're not doing one of these things. So you want to make sure that the torso stays tall, even if it's tilted backwards. So inhaling, feed the energy of your right arm into the floor. And as you exhale, pull, not too hard, with your left arm. And another part of twisting that I should have mentioned on the first side is how much you turn your head and your neck. Because we, when we think twist, you know, teaching for about 15 years, what I notice is when a twist is being taught, all people seem to be concerned with is what's happening to the chest, how far am I turning the torso and everything, but much less attention is paid to the head. But the neck has to be able to rotate to retain its function throughout our life. So when you exhale, try to turn your head as long as you're not bearing down on pain, to where your nose could eventually be almost at the same angle as your right shoulder. But when you train your neck to rotate better and more intelligently, you are simultaneously training the rest of the spine. One more breath out. Good. And then inhale, come back to center. And then starting on all fours, we're going to go into a lunge. So with your right foot forward and your left knee down, if you need to pad your left knee with a blanket or anything, feel free to do that. And then you're going to come up. So this is our low lunge. Left knee below the left hip, right knee right above the right ankle. And while you're in this twist, just bring your arms behind you to get a little bit more access into the shoulders. Hold your opposite elbows if possible. If it's not possible, hold somewhere up to the elbows. Now, if you do want to go a couple of steps even further with your shoulders, you can go ahead, if you know how to do it, take reverse prayer with your hands. But again, it's not essential as long as you have your arms behind you so you can then start to pull your shoulders back. And keep the low belly lifted. Engage the left glute first, and what I'm asking you to do is crawl your right foot forward a little bit with your toes. Okay, so we're going to do another little dynamic movement, which is going to be inhaling to stay up in this position, and as you exhale, you're going to lunge forward. And the whole idea when you lunge forward is to see how close you can get your back thigh to the floor. All right, so inhale, you come back up, keep your shoulders back. Exhale, lift the low belly as you lunge forward. Inhale, you come back up. Exhale, lunge forward again. Inhale up. Exhale. 
One more time. Inhale. Exhale. Good. Now from there, bring your hands to the mat. Keep your left hand in line with your left shoulder from a lateral position. So not off to the left, not off to the right. So in line laterally, but bring it slightly forward. So your wrist is a little bit ahead of your shoulder, as you can see here. Right hand goes on the right knee or thigh. Keep your back toes curled for this one. And then start to turn your head over your right shoulder. Engage your left butt. And use both arms just to press away from their respective surfaces to just encourage a little bit more of a twist. And so how we change this twist is before you were sitting on your knees, sitting on your shins, now you're in a lunge. So you're putting the left side of your hip flexor, your psoas muscle, in more length while also twisting. So you get to accomplish two tasks. You get to accomplish improving your rotational flexibility, which is a thoracic spine action, and you're getting to improve your lower back in hip flexibility in the direction of extension. We'll take one more breath out here. Good. We usually want to pull ourselves out of a pose on an inhale and then switch feet. So again, start with where your left knee is above the left heel, your right knee is below the right hip. And now bring your arms back behind you. This time, clasp your hands, interlace your fingers, and look how I do this. So you want to rotate your knuckles towards your tailbone. So your knuckles aren't pointing down, but also make sure they're not horizontal. You're not just pushing straight forward into your pelvis. The angle is diagonal, right? It's almost like you're pushing your knuckles towards the direction of the front heel. So as you push your knuckles into your sacrum and your pelvis, simultaneously pull your elbows and shoulders back, and then just stay with that. While you have your hands there, you can notice whether or not your right glute's engaged. So engage that, lift your lower belly, crawl your left foot forward a little bit more. Start with a nice, bountiful inhale. And as you exhale, lunge forward, watching the contraction of your right glute, keeping your elbows back. Inhale up. Exhale, try to narrow your elbows while keeping your right glute active. Inhale. Exhale. A couple more. Remember, the whole objective is to try to get your right thigh closer to the mat. Exhale, forward. One more time. Big inhale. Fill your belly, fill your ribs, and exhale. Sit low, 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 low. Keep your right glute with you. And then keep the right glute engaged as you bring your right hand down left hand on your thigh. Remember, keep your right wrist a little bit forward of the shoulder. It's going to be a lot more protective to the shoulder. And then look over your left shoulder. Pressing down with both arms is going to encourage a little bit more rotation. But remember, it's all about precision. And the other thing is when we twist, the tendency when we twist, when we try to go deep, is the side that we're twisting to, that side of the torso, will tend to compress and shorten. So here, when we're twisting to the left, there is going to be a pretty strong tendency for the left side of the body to contract. We want to keep that side of the body nice and long. So more than just aiming for more and more degrees of movement, put your sights, your feelers, into the way that you're actually moving, even if the degree of motion that you feel you currently have isn't much. One more breath out. Good. Inhale, come back to center. And now we're going to do another lunge. So you're going to step your right foot forward. And I'm just turning around so you can see what I'm doing here. So again, we're starting with a low lunge, but we're going to add another twist into it. Today we're going to twist because I want to focus on freeing up some of the tension that we usually have around our chest and our ribs because our thoracic spine to which our ribs are attached is what allows most of our twisting, right? Twisting happens in the thoracic spine mostly. And so our flexibility of the thoracic spine 
also impacts our ribs because the ribs are attached to the thoracic spine. In the ribs, you need to be able to be flexible in order for you to breathe the way that you should and deserve to breathe. So we're going to start with the right hand right there at the root of the thigh, fingers facing to the knee. You're going to lift your left arm up, take a nice long inhale, and then as you exhale, turn to the right and start to fold. And like I was saying in the previous twist, when you fold and twist, don't let the right side of the body shorten because that can actually expose your discs to a little more danger. But just inhale, get nice and long. And as you exhale, two things. You're only twisting and folding on top of the leg. So that's going to present your elbow to your front knee. And from here, you can place your hands together and continue with the rest of the twist as is. If you want to add a little bit more flexibility work to the shoulders, you're going to try and just watch how I do this. So I'm going to inhale first. And as I exhale, I'm going to try to slide more of my upper arm to the outside of the knee. And if you can eventually get to a place where your knee and your armpit are situated on each other, you can try to go for a bind, which you're going to start with your palm facing down, fingers facing back, and then you're going to try to rotate your hand underneath you. You can use your other hand to help and place your hand to, towards the left hip, the opposite hip. And then you reach your right arm around and either grab the fingertips, but if you have more flexibility, grab the right wrist with the left hand. Okay, so this is our bind and this is the twist. If you want to add a little more energy to the twist, all you have to do is just lift your back knee. And we'll take five more breaths. But whether or not you're lifting your back knee doesn't really carry too many implications on the depth of your twist. It just helps to fortify your legs, which is also a great idea to take care of our back. Last breath out. Inhale, come back out, and then switch sides. So left foot forward, right knees down, left hand on the left hip crease, or actually left hand at the root of the thigh. Lift your right arm up, and again, take a giant inhale. And as you exhale, just try to isolate a twist on top of the fold. Now, if you have chronic um, recurring low back pain, and there's a certain degree of twist that kind of zaps it, then don't twist that deep. Twisting is still important, but if you twist too much, if you have some disc issues there, that can kind of take you a little bit out of what's actually therapeutic. So when you bring your elbow down to the front knee, again, if you're interested in going further, again, that means you're going to exhale, slide as much of your right arm to the outside of your left leg, and then having your palm facing down, fingers pointing back, you push your right hand underneath the thigh, and then you reach around, either grab your fingers or your wrists. But on this side, I'm just going to demonstrate the prayer position of the hands. So whatever your position of the arms, it's up to you whether or not you want to lift your back knee. But if you lift your back knee, you have to put a little bit more focus on how your front leg pushes against the elbow that's on it. Whether or not you're binding. Because your front leg has to have this ability to resist the, the pressure of the arm so that you don't fall over. And this starts to train another very, very important skill for your hips called abduction, abduction. Let's take two more breaths. And eventually, if you don't need your eyes on the ground, keep your senses in your feet and legs so that you're balancing. Last breath out. Inhale, untwist, and then hands on the mat. And now let's go into a little bit of quadricep and psoas work. So you might need one or two blocks. And I'll just show this with one block. But if you need more than that, you can follow along in the same way. <clears throat> Come up towards the front of your mat a little bit so that you have extra mat space behind you. We'll start with the left leg. So look down at the left leg. Make sure that your toes are pointing straight back and make sure the outer part of your hip is in line to the inner heel. So no matter how high you're sitting, the inner heel and the outer hip should be on the exact same plane, right? Because my outer inner heel and outer hip are touching, 
I can't even really slide my finger in between. So that's what you want. Then look at the angle of your left thigh. Make sure that your knee is in line to the hip. And then roll over to your left hip. Set your right foot down. And here's where we're going to start to get right into it. I'll move forward a little bit more. Lean back onto your hands first. Notice initially just how that feels on your knee, on your quadricep muscle, even on your low back. And what I'm going to have you do, make sure your fingertips are facing forward to protect the shoulders, is you're going to lift your pelvis the bare minimum amount necessary just to be able to pull your butt in. So that's a posterior pelvic tilt. We all know what it feels like if you wanted to stick your butt out. So here, that means the opposite. So you lift, you pull your butt as if into the body, and then you lay down a higher part of your glutes onto the block, and maybe that allows you to come down to your elbows. Just notice how that feels. But once you're on your elbows, you have to go through the same thing. So again, press with the elbows, lift your pelvis, pull your butt in and see if you can get yet another higher part of your butt onto the block. Those of you that are not on the block or if you're on started on the block and you notice this really isn't that much pressure, isn't that much of a stretch, you can go ahead and take the block out. Make sure that your butt gets to the floor safely, it doesn't hurt your knee. Then you can start to lay back one shoulder at a time until your whole torso is down. So whether you're on the block or not, you want to make sure that your chest sticks out. If you're on a block, don't lay down. Stay on the elbows and make sure that your chest sits a little bit higher than your shoulders from the ground. We're going to take about five more breaths here. Make sure you're pressing your toenails of the left foot into the floor, which will keep your ankle stable because you see your foot here is has to already be in a pretty extreme range of plantar flexion and want to be able to protect the ankle from this common side of sprain which usually happens on the lateral part of the ankle just by engaging all toes into the mat okay now when we start to come up one elbow and then one hand at a time when you come forward set your right knee down and extend your left leg back just to give it a little stretch, just to get the quadriceps reactivated, to get your knee repositioned, and then we'll go the other direction. So you're going to start sitting on the block again. Look at your right foot. Make sure the toes are facing straight back. Make sure that when you look at your thigh, it makes a straight line right out from the hip. Look forward a little bit again. Okay, so then lean back onto your hands, lift your butt, posterior tilt, land a higher part of your glutes down. Maybe come down to your elbows. Press with your elbows, lift your butt, posterior tilt, land another higher part of your pelvis down. And if this is as far as you go, make sure that your chest sticks up and you can either keep your chin closer to the chest when you do this, and if it doesn't feel painful, you can let your head relax back. But if you are letting your head relax back, you can't have your head be higher than your chest. Your head has to be below the chest. That way it's safe on the neck. And as we finish off with the last two or three breaths, keep pressing your right toenails into the mat. See if you can even try to press your right shin bone down. Good, and then carefully come up, elbow by elbow, hand by hand. Come forward on all fours. Stretch your right knee back. Get some engagement and circulation into your quadricep for about two, three, maybe four breaths. Excellent. And then you're going to lay down on your back. So what we did today was we put in some good work on the hips because the hips are the basis of low back flexibility. And what we're going to finish with is a back bend. Before we do that, just a little bit more background on why it is that 
getting our hamstrings and our hips more flexible has to be one of our main priorities in addressing any kind of chronic low back condition because it's the fact that our hamstrings are not flexible that positions our pelvis in a way that compresses and wears away the low back. So when our hamstrings have a minimum amount of flexibility, which is sufficient flexibility to have the pelvis sit the way that it should, that pelvic position allowed by the hamstring then lets your lower back sit the way that it was intended to sit on the pelvis, and you end up actually flourishing. So we don't need miles of hamstring flexibility. We just need the bare minimum amount so that the pelvis doesn't feel strained. And that's it. So finishing with a back bend in this case is going to mean we're doing bridge pose. Feet are flat, knees are bent, and then just gently start to press your legs and feet into the floor and lift your pelvis up. So back bend is really the nature of the shape of your low back. So if you do back bends, you're reconstituting the original curve that your lower back has to have in order to operate better and more healthfully, more functionally. So doing bridge pose allows us to strengthen our glutes, glutes being the basis of that curve in the low back. So as you sit up here, make sure that your knees don't splay out wide. Keep your knees in line with the hips. Keep your toes facing forward. And actually interlace your fingers underneath you. Shuffle your shoulders side to side. Try to get your shoulders more narrow. And extend your neck away from the body. The higher you can lift your chest, your sternum will start to kind of creep up onto your chin. And as it does that, don't try to touch your chest with your chin. Imagine that your whole head is sliding further and further away from the chest the higher the chest lifts. Good. Last couple of breaths. Really hit your heels into the floor and try to drag your heels, isometrically drag your heels towards your shoulders, towards your hands. One more deep breath in. And as you exhale, go ahead and come on down. Make sure your knees are together, your feet are apart. Close your eyes. This position, called hook line position, where your knees are together, your feet are separated, this is a perfect shavasana to end in. So get your blanket back out. Make sure you have something supporting your head. It doesn't have to be a thick lift, but at least some softness under your head will always feel a lot better. And if you have something, also pull, get like a little towel or maybe a shirt so that you can put it over your eyes. You can also use a strap, especially if you have one like this that has a little bit of a thicker material to it, wider material, and you can lay that over your eyes. Whatever you're laying over your eyes, you want to try to get it to cover the entire eye socket area so it prevents any possible light from sneaking in through the eyelids and stimulating your visual part of the brain. Remember this position of your legs. Next. So now try to straighten your legs to the floor. Now you don't have a belt around them. Just let the legs relax, let the body relax, and let that continue happening for the next minute. And if you notice after that minute that your lower back starts to kind of feel a little bit cramped up or congested or just not, not all that uh, happy, what's likely happening is that your psoas muscles haven't been able to release enough, so they're kind of yanking on the low back and pulling it slightly out of position. So if that's happening and you're uncomfortable with your legs straight, just come back to the hook line position. And with the hook line position, you can keep your feet 
either very wide away from each other or very close. That depends on your hip flexibility. But there's going to be a certain distance that's right for you where your thighs can land against each other. They can kind of lean against each other. And then just remain. You can turn your legs off and they'll stay right there. And now this is our Shavasana. So please stay as long as you as you can if you have the time until until you actually feel that once you start moving you can take these qualities or at least just the central quality of softness and ease with you when you actually start to move out and thank you for joining me today always a pleasure to to guide you have a great rest of your day or your evening, and I'll see you in the next class. Namaste.